Well, if you had to, if you, had, if, if you were to ask me, uh, what's a single word to describe Palm Sunday? It would be the word celebration. That's how I would sum up what takes place in Palm Sunday. This marks the beginning, as, as Jesus is entering into the city, it marks the beginning of what is known as Passover week amongst the people of Israel. And in Passover, all the people of Israel were required to, this is one of the three feasts that they were required to gather in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Passover, and Jesus is no exception. And uh, what he does is, as he's coming into the city somewhere around the Mount of Olives, has anybody ever been to Israel and, 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 and seen this in person? I haven't seen this in person, but I've seen pictures, and I, I, I know the geography a little bit. Um, somewhere around the Mount of Olives, which is just outside the city of Jerusalem, Jesus asked two of his disciples to go ahead into the city and, and find a donkey for him. And the two disciples, they go and they and, and they find a donkey there and they, they gather it and they bring it back to the Lord and, and they seek the Lord upon it. Now that seems like kind of a strange thing to ask for as you're walking into the city. Why in the world does he ask for a donkey? And he does that to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9, which is a prophecy of the Messiah riding in to Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. And it's this... It's this uh, uh, prophecy of rejoicing is a command to the people of God to rejoice because here is your king. He comes riding to you on the donkey, the foal of the donkey. And so that's the scene as Jesus is uh, at the Mount of Olives in and around that area. And then he begins to uh, travel down the hill, uh, down the Mount of Olives. And if you know the geography, uh, you know that uh, you go from the Mount of Olives and you go down into the Kidron Valley and you cross the river and then you start marching up into the city of Jerusalem. And the, and, and the path that he's on is, is he's traveling to the temple. That's where Jesus is headed. And John's Gospel tells us that this event takes place shortly after or right after, within a very short time, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And it tells us that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John tells us this in, in John chapter 11, there was people there, there was Jews there from the city. They were there originally to mourn with Lazarus' family, but then they were there to celebrate what Jesus had done in raising this man from the dead. And so there's this small band that, that, that starts out from Bethany and Bethpage and travels through the Mount of Olives, and Jesus is traveling down the hill on the pole of the donkey. Well, Jesus had become quite famous by this time. Everybody knew who Jesus was, or at least they had heard who Jesus was. Here is a man who has healed the blind. He's caused the deaf to hear. He's caused the lame to walk. And now he's even raised the man from the dead. And during Passover, Jerusalem's population would swell to somewhere between 2 and 3 million people in this ancient city. So the city is just jammed with people. And I just imagine that, that, that Jesus is starting out in this small band of disciples. He's riding on this donkey. And, and then they, they, they put their cloaks on the donkey for him to sit on. And then they begin to, uh, they begin to put their cloaks on the road for, for him as he rides down the way. And then when they run out of cloaks, they have these palm branches that they're waving in celebration. You have to appreciate that the palm branch by this time in Israel's history had become a bit of a national symbol. 170 years before uh, the Lord Jesus rode into the city on this donkey, there was a man named Simon Maccabee who had won this great military victory and he had liberated the city of Jerusalem from the Syrians, a foreign power. And as, they were, as he marched in for his celebration, they were waving palm branches in celebration of his victory. And that's what they're doing when Jesus comes into the city. They're waving these palm branches. It's like there's this celebration of the victorious king entering into the city. That's what's happening as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And then as the crowd, uh, it starts out as just a few disciples. Uh, and then as he gets down into the valley and marches up into the city, the crowd begins to build. 
You just imagine it wouldn't take long in a city that's filled over, over its capacity, has two or three million people in it. Uh, you, somebody runs on ahead. Here comes Jesus! You, you mean that guy who, 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 who heals the sick and raises the dead? Let's go see. And then you get uh, sort of like a mob forming. And people join the crowd. And before long, there's, there's hundreds of people. Before long, there's thousands of people. Then, then I can just imagine that one person in the crowd yells out the word, Hosanna! And then another Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna to the Son of David! Before long, you have one voice joining another and another and another. Before long, you have the whole crowd shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David. Uh, Just to get the feel for that, I may have done this last year, but it's worth repeating. Just to get the feel for that, would you just join me in one Hosanna, everybody, just as, as loudly as you can? All right? So, everybody together. Hosanna! That was good. Well done. Just imagine what that must have been like to be in the crowd on that day when Jesus rides into the city declaring that He is the long-awaited King. Everybody's been waiting for the Messiah. Everybody's been waiting for the Son of David that's prophesied in the Old Testament, prophesied in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Zechariah, all through the Old Testament, just waiting with excitement for their King to come and save them. And Jesus comes in, fulfilling that prophecy. Everybody's just so excited because they think He's the King. They think He's the Messiah. And as I think about that scene, I've only got one question that comes to my mind. And that is, how do I join in on that? How do I join in on that celebration? How do I join in in those shouts of Hosanna? That's what I want. God in His graciousness has preserved these hosannas echoing down through the centuries, echoing, ringing in our ears this morning. And I want to know, how can we join in? That's what we're going to think about this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. I kind of summarized for you the march of Jesus into the city. I want to look at a few verses of what takes place next. Because here is Jesus at the end of His journey into the city and He makes His way to the temple. And if we want to join in the shouts of Hosanna, if we want to get in on this praise of the Lord Jesus, there's some things that we need to consider here in this text. Here's the first thing. Um, this actually shows us how we harm the Hosannas, how we, how we prevent ourselves from joining in. Here's the first thing we need to consider is that secularizing the sacred diminishes our capacity for praise. I was tempted when I was thinking about, uh, when, I, when I wrote this first point, I was tempted to put in the word eliminates. Secularizing the sacred eliminates our capacity for praise. But I thought, I, I don't know the hearts of other people. I don't know how much secularization it takes to completely eliminate. So I went with diminish it, because that, that's certain. If we secularize the sacred, it diminishes our capacity for praise. The temple that Jesus arrives at here in verse 12 is the most sacred place, the most holy place in all of Israel. This is the place where God had caused His glory to dwell in the Holy of Holies. And if you know uh, the history of, or if you know the Old Testament, you know that where God's presence is, that is a holy place. That is a sacred place. It's set apart by God. And look at what Jesus finds here in verses 12 and 13. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. 
He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, He said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it into a den of robbers. He finds four things going on there. First, he finds those buying, and he finds those selling, he finds those changing money, and he makes a special mention, or or Matthew makes a special mention here, of those selling doves. Those are the things that Jesus finds when he enters the temple. Now remember, it's Passover. So people had come from all over the nation of Israel. A lot of people had to travel a far, far distance to get to the nation of Israel and it was, or to get to the city of Jerusalem. And it was impractical for them to take the animals that were required for them to worship at the temple. So what they had done is they had set up a marketplace, a place where you could come and you could buy lambs and you could buy goats. And doves gets a special mention there because the doves, those are uh, the offerings of the poor People who couldn't afford a lamb, they would buy a dove and be able to worship the Lord. And so what they did is they set up this market where people who traveled from long distance, they didn't have to haul their animals all the way. They could just bring money. But here's the thing. You couldn't just use plain old money. Canadian dollars wouldn't work at the temple. You couldn't use the regular currency of the day. You had to use the currency that was accepted by the temple authorities. That's why there's money changers there. You'd go and you'd take the irregular currency and you'd exchange it for temple currency and then you'd be able to buy and sell the sacrifices that you would need and that money would then go into the temple. Now here's the thing. When you have a monopoly on the market, there's a high degree of corruption. There's a high degree of possibility for corruption, for cheating people. I mean, how many people have been to the movie theater recently? A a pop and a bag of popcorn does not cost $20, right? But that's what you pay at the movie theater. It's it's, it's the same sort of thing going on here, is that uh, you've got a a, a monopoly. There's There's a market that no one else is in on, and what happens is people begin to cheat others. They're even cheating the poor. That's why the doves are mentioned there. And Jesus walks in and He sees this and he's, he's angry. He's angry. Notice He quotes Scripture here. He says in verse 13, It is written, He said to them, My house should be called a house of prayer. That's Isaiah 56, verse 7. And then He quotes Jeremiah chapter 7, Verse 11, next, when he says, you are making, my house, you are making it into a, a den of robbers. I love the fact that Jesus quotes Scripture all the time when he's, when he's saying something authoritative, when he's, when he's uh, debating someone on theology, when he's teaching people. He's always quoting Scripture. You know? And I think there's an important lesson for us there. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God who is God Himself, if He believed in the sufficiency of Scripture, if He believed that what, you, what we should do is quote Scripture, is know Scripture, is get our authority from Scripture, how much more should we get our authority from Scripture? You know, there's all kinds of people looking for more than the Bible. We want, we want God to do more. We, we, we want God to speak to us in another way other than Scripture. Well, Jesus didn't think so. <laughs> he quotes Scripture, and we should too. The first one he quotes is Isaiah 56. In Isaiah 56, if you read it, it's all about an invitation. It's an invitation to the people of God to come to the temple, to come and delight and celebrate who God is, to worship Him, to spend time in prayer and spend time growing closer to their God. And then Jeremiah 7 Jeremiah 7, is all, it's all about an indictment against the people of Israel. It's about the people of Israel who are worshiping false gods. It's about the people of Israel who are taking advantage of the poor and committing acts of sin and evil. And here they are. They come into the house of God as though nothing's wrong. 
They come into the house of God and they offer their sacrifices, they offer their prayers, and they don't, they, it's totally disconnected from the evil acts that they're doing when they're outside the temple. And God says to them, you've turned my house into a, a den of robbers. In other words, it's a hideout for evil people. It's no longer a house of prayer. And Jesus is quoting those two scriptures to highlight this point. They're secularizing the sacred. Something that's supposed to be holy. Something that's supposed to be set apart by God. They're treating it like a business. They're treating it like a a money-making opportunity. And, 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 And here's... Here's something that should cause us to tremble. What we see here in what Jesus does is that when we secularize the sacred, it angers God. It angers God. Jesus isn't uh, going around making people feel good and welcome in the temple. He's going in there flipping over tables. It says He's driving them out. Get out of here! Now these were no... Uh, what would you call them? Uh, These are no soft people that are behind these tables. These These are people who dealt with rough crowds all the time in their business practice, and yet they flee before the Lord Jesus. So I imagine as Jesus flips over these tables and as He yells uh, for them to get out and as He quotes Scripture to them, there is a holy fire in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ that would strike fear into our hearts if we were to see it. There is a holy fire in the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ as He says, get out of this place. This is not what the temple is for. How can we pray? How can you worship when there's the sound of a market going on? You know, you ever you ever tried to pray when there's all kinds of noise and racket going on? You ever tried to worship when there's distraction happening? It just doesn't work. And here they filled the the they filled the temple with the noises of commerce instead of the noise of worship, and it angers the Lord Jesus Christ. That should cause us to tremble as people who I trust want to come and want to gather together and worship the Lord, we need to be careful that we don't turn the sacred into the secular. We don't have uh, booths in the lower auditorium or when you walk into the elevator entrance to buy and sell animals. We don't have the sound of money changers happening in our churches today, but there is a danger in secularizing the sacred all the same. I was thinking about some of the ways in which we could do that, and one of the most striking things that came to my mind was that we can turn worship into entertainment. That's a danger not only for those of us who lead in worship, but it's also a danger for those of us who sit in the pew. When we come and we, and we seek to lead in worship, well, I'll just speak for myself here, there's a great danger, there's a great, tempt, there's a great temptation to give people what they want. You know, how many times have I heard people say about church growth and what you ought to do is you ought to take a survey and see what people like and see what people want. There's a great temptation there because, I mean, who doesn't want their church to be full? As a pastor, we all, I haven't met a pastor yet who says, you know, I'd really love it when only three people show up on a Sunday morning. And there's a great danger to turn the leading of worship into entertainment. What will they like? What will they want to hear? What will make them feel good? What will make them come back? We do, it's a danger in preaching. It's a danger in leading music. It's, it's a danger to become entertainers. 
But there's a danger for you folks sitting in the pew that you would become consumers. Was I entertained today? Did he say something that I wanted to hear that made me feel good? Was the music what I liked or I enjoyed? We can sit there and we can just say, entertain me, entertain me, entertain me. It's easy to turn the secular, or it's easy to turn the sacred into something secular. But here's the thing, it, when we do that, it diminishes our capacity to praise. We will never be able to join in to the shouts of Hosanna that we read here that are echoing in our ears over the course that have come down to us through the ages, through the Word of God. We'll never be able to join in to those shouts of Hosanna if we're interested in entertainment, if we think that's what church is about, we won't be able to do it. Joining in the shouts of Hosanna doesn't come from cries, the cries of our hearts saying, entertain me. That, that, that eliminates or diminishes our praise. Okay, so now we know what diminishes our praise what will help then? What, what, what will enable us to join in those shouts of Hosanna? Well, we need to recognize what happens next here in verse 14. In verse, in verse 14, here's, here's what we see. We see that Christ's healing power both deserves and requires our praise. It is impossible... Do you know why? At the end of the day, I, 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 when I struggle with the temptation of being an entertainer or just saying what people want to hear or just making people happy, being a, a man pleaser or, or a woman pleaser or a people pleaser, do you know what wins the day for me? And, 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 and says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to the best of my ability to give them the Word of God. And that's because if if... If my desire, and it should be as your pastor, this is the only loving thing to do, my desire is for us to all enter into these joyful shouts of Hosanna and praise. If that's really my desire, then what you need is not to be entertained. What you need is the Holy Spirit to work in your heart, to change your heart, to make you love the Word of God. It is impossible to join in the shouts of Hosanna unless Jesus has made you well. So then, Christ's healing power both deserves and requires our praise. Verse 14 is, is a short verse, but it says a lot to us here. Look at verse 14. The blind and the lame came to Him at the temple and He healed them. Now what is so powerful about that verse is, is the fact that the religious authorities, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they shunned the blind, the deaf, the lame, those who had physical disabilities, were not, listen to this, they, the people that we read about here in verse 14, the blind and the lame and others, like them, listen, they were not welcome in the temple by those who ran the temple. So here you have these people who, 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 who not only they're suffering physically, but they're suffering, physic for they're suffering spiritually because they can't get into the temple to worship God because they're not allowed. It's a sad, sad picture. And then Jesus comes. And he throws out, oh, the religious authorities, they love the money changers. They love the guys who are buying and selling because they were making cash off of it. It was, they were making money. They love those guys. But the, the blind, the poor, the lame, no, no, no. Those guys aren't welcome in the house of God. You contrast that with Jesus. It says here, and the blind and the lame came to him. Where did they come to him? At the temple. 
That, that's amazing that they, they get to come into the temple. Not only did they get to come into the temple and worship, which they were never allowed to do because of the religious authorities who ran the temple, but not, not only were they able to do that, but they're healed by the Lord Jesus. And they'll be able to continue to come back and worship at the temple. Amazing what Jesus does here. I don't know about you, but when I study Scripture, when I uh, am reading passages like this, especially narrative, uh, especially when they're giving us an account of something that took place in history, I often ask myself the question, I often ask myself the question, where do I fit in the story? Like, if I was able to insert myself into the story, if I was able to be there, who would I be? Where, where do I fit into the story? I was struck as I came to verse 14 this week, struck right to the very core of my being. You know who I am in this story? I'm the blind and the lame people. That's where I fit in the story. I think back to my life before knowing Christ and the only way to describe who I was before that day is that I was blind. I was blind to my sin. I was blind to the great offense that I've committed against the Holy God. I, I thought I was a good guy. You would have probably thought so too. I'm glad some of you laughed at that. <laughs> My dad just said most days. <laughs> you did say that, right? Did I hear that right? <laughs> I, thought, I thought God was happy with me. I thought I was a good person. I thought... One day, many years down the road, if, if I would ever die, that I would be welcomed into heaven, open arms. I was blind to the holiness of our God. I was blind to His righteousness. I was blind to just how great He is. And how high His standard is. I was blind to all that. And then I heard the gospel preached. And my eyes are opened. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm a sinner. What am I going to do? And as my eyes are opened, I realize, you know, I, I, I don't just have a problem of being blind to my own condition of who I am and who God is. That's not my only problem. I'm also lame. Because there's nothing I can do to get there can't pick myself. I used to think, oh, it's, it's easy to make God happy. It's easy to please Him. And my eyes are open. It's like, there's no way. There's no way I can get there on my own. It's like I'm, I'm lame. I'm just sitting in this spot and I'm totally helpless. There's no way I can get to God. And Jesus not only opens my eyes, brings healing so that I can see my sin. I can see the holiness of God, He also takes me to the foot of the cross. He takes me to the place where not me, but Jesus has made the way for me. Jesus has paid my debt. Jesus has satisfied a holy and wrathful and righteous God. He takes me there. And He heals me. Who am I in this story I'm these people who are blind and lame. And because Jesus heals the heart of those who repent and put their faith in Him, we can then, He then enables us to join in those shouts of Hosanna. It's only, through, it's only through Jesus that we can join in, that He enables us to be able to worship Him properly. But there's more than that though. It's not just that His healing means that we can engage in proper worship, that we can join in the shouts of Hosanna. It's more than that. 
we must, we must join in the shouts of Hosanna. I mean, when Jesus brings healing to my spiritual vision and to the brokenness of my spiritual body, He enables me to come to, the, to God through the cross of Christ. He opens my mind to who He is, that He's the Creator of all things. The Creator who entered into His creation to redeem it. That Christ loves me though I am unlovable. That Christ sacrificed everything for me, though He owes me nothing. That Christ gladly endures the cross to save His people to the glory of His Father. That Christ is the one who sends the Holy Spirit to make my heart new so that I can join in the shouts of Hosanna. It's not just that I can. I have to. How can I not? Any one of those things, and there's much more about who the Lord Jesus is, any one of those things makes Him worthy of praise. But when you start thinking about them all together, it's like, it's like your heart fills up to, uh, to, to beyond its capacity and it bursts forth in shouts. Of Hosanna. You ever see a raging river like a flood type situation? And, and, and people are stacking sandbags on the banks of the river trying to stop it from overflowing? You know, when God heals us of our spiritual blindness and our spiritual lameness and our spiritual deafness and all the things that keep us from God, when, when God heals us of all of that, it's like it's this raging river of the Holy Spirit moving us to praise Him for all that He's done. And you could sooner hold back the raging flood, the raging waters of a flooding river with a single piece of paper than you could hold back the praises of someone redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's not just that we can praise, it's that we must praise when Christ heals. In fact, that's why He heals us. That's why He saves us according to Ephesians 1, verse 14. That we are saved to the praise of the glory of God. So here's this scene of Jesus. He's ridden into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, declaring Himself to be the Messiah, the Son of David. There's all these shouts of Hosanna as the parade makes its way towards the temple. And then there's a brief pause in the parade when Jesus clears out the temple of these money changers and those selling and buying. And then the praise continues. The celebration continues as, as Jesus heals and restores the lives of broken people. But not everybody who is there is praising. Not everybody who is there is joining in shouts of Hosanna. So here's the third thing that we need to consider if we want to join in the shouts of Hosanna. Here's the third thing. That God-ordained praise is impossible to silence, but it is possible to accompany that God before the foundation of the world in all eternity past has decreed, has commanded the praises of His Son. You can't stop that. But we can join in. And that's what, that's what I want for us this morning. The miracles that Jesus performs in healing the blind and the lame cause the celebration to continue. Here we pick it up in verse 15 in the first half of verse 16. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things He did, and the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked Him. They see it. They see the wonderful things that Jesus is doing. And they're angry. Jesus clears the temple and He makes it a place of worship again instead of a, a market. He, he brings silence 
to the sound of coins and to the sound of animals waiting in the outer courts to be sold. Now it's a place where people can pray and worship, if even just for a short time. He's brought in the outcasts who are not usually welcome, and He's brought healing. I would say that's wonderful things, wouldn't you? The healing of the lame and the blind. Jesus is doing wonderful things. And there's children present here. There's children present here. Probably children who are there in Jerusalem for the Passover, and they are of the age where it's their first time getting to go to the temple to celebrate one of the greatest celebrations in Jewish culture, the Passover feast. And not only do they get to go into the temple and worship the Lord for the first time in their lives and celebrate the Passover, but here they get to see Jesus perform all these wonderful things and they join in. They join in the shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna to the Son of David. They're saying, Hosanna, praise the Messiah. He's the one. He's the King. I mean, they're just excited. You ever see kids waiting to get into an amusement park? They're just ready to go. That's these kids here as they shout Hosanna to the Lord Jesus. The teachers of the law who've just seen a lot of their money for that day go out the door because Jesus stopped the market and they now hear Him uh, being praised as the Son of David, as the Messiah. They, it says they're indignant, which means they're angry, they're upset. And so they ask the question, did you hear? Verse 16, look at it there. This is the question they're asking. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked. Jesus can hear it. They're shouting in the temple courts. Jesus can hear what they're saying. Do you hear what they're saying when they're asking the question? Do you hear? They're not asking the question, do you hear with your ears? They're really asking the question, why aren't you stopping these kids? Here are these men who have spent a lifetime studying the Bible, who spent a lifetime serving and apprenticing under rabbis. I mean, most of these guys that are upset and angry with Jesus, they're probably north of 50. And here comes this relatively young man. Jesus is 33 by this time when He enters the city on that day. Now, you weren't even allowed to be a rabbi until you were 30 years old. So here Jesus is. It's like if, these, if you were to ask these guys what they think of Jesus, he's just a young upstart. Here are these guys who have paid these dues for all these years. And they're supposed to be reaping the benefit. They're supposed to be the ones who people come to. They're supposed to be the ones who are getting the praises. And here Jesus is. He's getting the praises from these little children. Now remember I said that the chief priests and teachers of the law, they didn't have much time for the lame and the blind and the deaf and those who were afflicted in their bodies. Well, they felt the same way about kids. You ever hear the phrase, children should be seen and not heard? Like when these kids come into the temple, they should be quiet and they should just sit there and observe. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. And here they are. They've joined in the shouts of Hosanna. They're praising the Lord Jesus. I mean, these guys are just fit to be tied. Do you hear what they're saying? They want Jesus to silence the praise. They want Jesus to silence the Hosanna. Can I just say to you that we are living in a culture that's trying to do the same? Our prime minister recently has argued that there should be laws against calling false religion false religion. Our prime minister recently has required that religious organizations and institutions agree to aberrant sexuality and the practice of abortion in order to have access to funds they previously had access to. 
And my question is, how long do you think it's going to be before our prime minister or our leaders in government say to us, you must bow the knee and kiss the ring and agree with our ideology, ideology before we take away your tax-exempt status? How long do you think it'll be before they do more than that? They say you have to bow the knee and kiss the ring and agree with our ideology or we'll put you in jail. What's happening there? They're trying to silence the Hosea. They're trying to silence our praise. They're trying to silence our worship of the Lord Jesus. But Jesus has some words for us here that should cause us to take great courage in the face. He doesn't shrink back. He's not, he's not trembling before the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He doesn't waver for a moment. Look at what he says in the second half of verse 16. They're saying, do you hear what they're saying? You should make them be quiet. Here's Jesus' answer. Yes, I hear them. Jesus replied, have you never read? Oh man, that's a little jab. That's actually a big jab that Jesus is making here. Of course they've read. They've been, they've been doing this their whole life. They probably have this memorized. Jesus is, 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 is calling them out. Have you never read? Don't you know? And then he says, From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. It's kind of like a drop the mic moment. <laughs> Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. That's a quote of Psalm 8, verse 2. What does that mean that God has ordained His praise? That means from all eternity past, from before creation and time began, God commanded that these children would cry out Hosanna to His Son, Jesus Christ. Now you can't stop that. You know, you ask, well, what's the point? Why does God ordain His praise from the lips of children? Here are children who have not yet uh, embraced the same kind of pride and selfishness that the religious leaders have at this point in their lives. They are, they are children whom no one would listen to for the most part about anything. And yet it's through their lips that God ordains praise. Why does He do that? So that we'll know that He's the one ordaining it. He ordains it through the lips of children. And the fact that God ordains it, the fact that God commands it from all eternity past, means that it's unstoppable. That's what that word ordained means. Jesus could have easily said to the teachers, even if I wanted to stop them, which I can't, and I don't want to, He couldn't stop it because it's been ordained by God. It'd be against the nature of Jesus to go against that which God commands. Jesus can't go against what God commands. They can't be stopped. Sure, the religious leaders could sit there with arms crossed and they could refuse to participate. They could plug their ears and they could be angry and upset. They could even try and stop it. Did you hear? Did you hear what they're saying? Stop it! But they can't. No matter how angry someone is, if you, you can be maybe somebody here this morning sitting in the pew and they're just arms crossed and they don't really, they're not really interested in, 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 in joining in the shouts of Hosanna. That's a choice for you. You can make that choice. But you can't stop it. It doesn't matter what law is passed in our country, the Hosannas will still ring. You know, Hosanna is an amazing word. It actually means to save. That's what the word means, is to save. But over the years in the life of Israel, it had become 
a word of praise. It was a way to say, we praise you, Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We praise, we praise you in the highest way. You deserve the highest praise. It's interesting though. How does a word that means save become a word that means praise? Because when you're saying, save us, when you're asking for God to deliver us for something, you're asking Him for something to take place in the future, right? That's what you're asking for. But it becomes a word of praise because the salvation of God in Jesus Christ is so certain. The future salvation of God in Jesus Christ is so certain because it's determined by the infinite power of Almighty God. It's so guaranteed that we can use the word as though it's already happened. So we can say, Hosanna, not just that Jesus will save, but that He has saved. We can't stop it. But we can do as these children do, and that is we can join in. We can join in. We can offer our Hosanna to join with the echoes of Hosanna that have come down through the centuries to today that are ringing in our ears that should be, that should be proclaimed from our lips. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the Son of David. Jesus saves, brothers and sisters. So I say, let your hosannas ring. King Jesus is seated on His throne right now, reigning over all things. So let your hosannas ring. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Lord, I know that there is richness and depth in this text which has eluded me. I know that there is glory and awe beyond what I have described here this morning. But, oh God, I would pray that You would be merciful. Merciful with the feeble efforts that have been exercised in these past few moments to give us just a glimpse, enough of the glory of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit would fill our hearts to the point where they burst with praise. Oh God, may our hosannas ring as we sing this last song together and as we go back out into the world, I pray. For Christ's sake, amen.